So now we know how to guard our hearts against the local to global heartbreak. How to make sure that when I have an infinite collection of truths that are quantified on an open cover of my set, that those truths do indeed glue together into a global truth for my entire set. We can do that either by insisting that every cover of my set, every open cover, have a finite subcover, and or we can do that by insisting that every sequence of points in my set has a subsequence whose limit belongs to my set. And we saw in the last video that those two ideas are actually the same idea, that every set that does one of them also does the other, and we call those sets the compact sets. So naturally, compact sets are going to be our best friends uh, because they're going to let us glue together those infinitely many truths into a single truth that works for our entire set. The problem is, cover finiteness, subsequential completeness, these are things that are not easy to spot in a set. You have to get to know a set pretty well before you can tell explicitly whether it's cover finite or whether it's subsequentially complete. Is there an easier way? Well, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is there is definitely an easier way to tell when a set is compact. The bad news is eh, it doesn't work in just every case. Right? The good news is that it works for every subset of the real numbers. In fact, it also works for every subset of n-dimensional Euclidean space. So we can do multi-dimensional real analysis and be assured of it. The bad news is there are other metric spaces, even other complete metric spaces, in which this conclusion is not true. So take what we're about to say with a grain of salt, that you can use it anywhere you want to while we're doing sort of standard single or multivariable real analysis but we might not be able to generalize this conclusion too far beyond that realm. And the conclusion is what's known as the famous Heine-Borel theorem. It says that every compact set is both closed and bounded. By the way, that's something we already knew. But also that the converse is true. That for subsets of the real numbers using the standard metric topology, every closed and bounded set is also a compact set. And because closeness and boundedness are so much easier to wrap our heads around, this gives us a much more efficient way of identifying which sets are cover finite, which sets are subsequentially complete, which sets are compact, which sets will allow us to avoid that local to global heartbreak. So let's take a quick overview of the Heine-Borel theorem and figure out what makes it work. So first of all, remember that we have already justified two or three videos ago why it is that every compact set is bounded, and why it is that every compact set is closed. We didn't need a lot of high-powered sort of tool work for this. We were able to show that compactness implies boundedness only by using the cover finiteness assumption. So the cover finiteness of compact sets is how we were able to prove that compact sets were bounded. Similarly, we used subsequential completeness to show that every compact set necessarily must be closed. And if you look back at those proofs from a couple of videos ago, there wasn't very much about them that seemed like it would have been specific to the real number system, right? That those results seem to hold just by making arguments about epsilon neighborhoods. And if epsilon neighborhoods are the only kinds of arguments that we're having to make, then chances are that that result is going to be good for any topology which is sort of based on, uses as a basis, the epsilon balls or the epsilon neighborhoods that arise from some metric. So in fact, compact implies closed and compact implies bounded is a result that's more generally true than just the real analysis with the standard metric topology case. And so it's going the other direction that could potentially get us into trouble. So we know that the statement that a subset K is compact only if it's both closed and bounded, in other words, compactness implies closed and bounded, that that statement is more generally true, but that in order to go the other way, we're probably going to need to specialize at some point to looking at subsets of the real numbers with the standard real metric topology that arises from using absolute value of the difference of two real numbers to measure distance. So if we want to go that other direction and get the if and only if into this statement, we should just always be mindful that this result doesn't necessarily generalize to just any topological space or even just any metric space or even just any complete metric space, which is kind of surprising. Um, but at least in Euclidean space, n-dimensional Euclidean space, we're guaranteed that this is going to work. And this theorem gets famously called the Heine-Borel theorem. It says that subsets of the real numbers are compact 
not only only if they're closed and bounded, but if and only if they're closed and bounded. So closed and bounded are the same thing, is the same thing as compact. So these arrows go both directions for subsets of the real line. So let me just give you a quick sketch of the proof of this statement. So we start out with a set which is closed and bounded. Our burden of proof then is to deduce that k is compact. And for this proof, that means we can show either that k is cover finite, or we can show that it's subsequentially complete, because we've already established in the previous video that those two notions are the same thing, they coincide, and they are what it means for a set to be compact in the more general setting. So how would we do that? Let's imagine that I have some subset of the real line, and let's assume that it's closed and bounded. So just as a picture, I'm going to kind of imagine that my set is a closed interval, maybe together with some isolated singletons or something, right? And so here's the idea. If I assume that k is bounded, that means that there is some closed interval minus m to m of the real line of which k is a subset. So this is sort of our first maneuver, is that k could be really complex, but we know for sure that k is a subset of just a single closed interval from minus capital M to capital M for some real number, capital M. And k is a closed subset of that interval. So the first thing that we might try to show is that the interval, the real interval from minus capital M to capital M, is a compact set. If we can show that sort of explicitly, then that reduces our burden of proof to potentially showing that every closed subset of a compact set gets to be compact. So this is going to be our, our two-step proof. We're going to prove something sort of very specific, that this closed interval from minus m to m is a compact set. And then we're going to show something that's very general. In fact, this is a true statement in any topological space, that if you give me a compact set and a closed subset thereof, that closed subset of a compact set automatically gets to be compact as well. So compactness inherits from a compact set down to its closed subsets. In a way, we can kind of think of this as almost analogous to saying that any subset of a bounded set has to be bounded. And so if we already believed that closed and bounded was the same thing as compact, this statement would be obvious, right? Uh, that of course a closed subset of a compact set would be compact if compact means closed and bounded, right? But we don't get to make that assumption because that would be begging the question in this proof. We are trying to establish that closed and bounded implies our previous notions of compactness. So let's do these two steps. First of all, to prove that the interval from minus m to m, the closed interval, is a compact set, let's appeal to subsequential completeness. Let me pick a sequence of points that belongs to my interval. Because this interval is bounded, that means that my sequence is bounded. And so by ye old bolzano weierstrass theorem, we know that that sequence xn possesses a convergent subsequence. So xnk that converges to a point, which we're going to call x. So now we know that this sequence has a convergent subsequence. But how do we know that that convergent subsequence's limit, x, belongs to my set i. That's the burden of proof for subsequential completeness, remember. So I have to show that x belongs to i. But since we happen to know that all of my x and k, all the members of my subsequence, satisfy that their absolute value is less than or equal to m, we also have this result from first semester analysis that shows that if that sequence is convergent, that sequence of a subsequence of, of the points of my original sequence, then the limit of that sequence must also be less than or equal to m. And since the limit is less than or equal to m, that means that the limit belongs to my set i. So that shows that i is a subsequentially complete set. Therefore, it's also cover finite. Therefore, it's what we call compact. So we've shown that this closed interval that contains my set is itself compact. So now we just need to show that compactness inherits from a compact set down to any closed subset thereof. And again, this result that we're about to show is more general than the real analysis setting that we're going to see it in. So let's suppose that S is a compact set, any compact set, and that L is a closed subset of S. We want to show that L is therefore compact. We appeal to subsequential completeness to establish the compactness of I. Just for the practice, let's appeal to cover finiteness in this part of the argument to establish the compactness of L. So to do that, I need to choose an arbitrary open cover of L, some collection of open sets 
of which L is a subset of the union of those sets. And this collection could be large. It could be infinite. It could be very infinite. Um, and our burden of proof is then to show that this open cover of L possesses a finite subcover, that only finitely many of these sets are actually needed to do the same job of covering L with their union. So here's the little nifty sleight of hand that we're going to use. So actually, I think there's a typo here. Let me fix it real quickly before we go forward. No, sorry, false alarm. We're OK. So what I'm going to do with this open cover of L is something nifty. I'm going to throw in one more set into this collection. So even if we started with infinitely many, I'm going to add one more. Because I need this collection of sets to do something more than just cover L. I want a new collection of sets that can cover S. Because if I find an open cover for S, we can use the compactness of S to extract a finite subcover of S from among that collection. But if I only know that I'm covering L with the UIs, right, I might need to do something a little bit more. And what I can do is I can throw in just one more open set, namely the complement of L in the whole topological space. If it's the real numbers, then that would be the real numbers here. Right? So the complement of L. And because L is, by assumption, a closed set, its complement is, therefore, an open set. Remember, closeness and openness, the easiest way to think about them, especially when it comes to writing proofs, is that they are complements of one another. Right? The complement of a closed set is open. The complement of an open set is closed. So when I do that, I get a new collection of subsets of my topological space, the real numbers, for example. And because it includes the complement of L, this means it's going to not only cover L with these sets, but it's also going to cover everything that's outside of L via this open set. And so this is actually going to give me an open cover for the entirety of my topological space. And in particular, it gives me an open cover of S. Right. So you should sort of talk through that implication and make sure that it, it sinks in for you. That just by throwing one more open set into this, we transform it from an open cover of L into an open cover of S, of which L is a subset. But since S is compact, this allows us to use the cover finiteness characterization of compactness. So there exists a finite subcover of this collection that includes all of my UIs, which were an open cover of L, and it also includes the complement of L. There includes a finite subcover. So we'll say n many of these UIs, together with maybe L complement, will be an open cover of S. Because S is compact, we know that such a finite subcover must exist. OK, so we now have a finite subcover of S, but that's not really what we need. If we're trying to show that L is compact, we need to have a finite subcover of L taken from among these original UIs. This doesn't quite do it. So then the question is, if I'm interested in L, which is a subset of S, do I have a finite subcover of L over here on the right-hand side? Well, a priori, I don't, because it might include this set, L complement, which was a part of my open cover of S, but was not part of my original open cover of L. And so that makes L complement off limits in my finite subcover. I can't use L complement because it wasn't part of my original open cover. Finite subcovers have to be extracted from the original open cover that we were provided. But the good news is that even if my op uh, finite subcover of S needs to include L complement, no finite subcover of L would need to include L complement. Because after all, L complement is disjoint from L. So even if L complement were a part of my supposed finite subcover of L, I could throw out L complement and be assured that I am still covering all of L. Because if L is contained in the union of these n sets from the cover, in addition to L complement, since L is disjoint from L complement, it is also contained in just the union of the finite number of n sets from the original cover. So if we remove L complement from this finite subcover, we might no longer cover S, but we are guaranteed that we will cover L. Therefore, we have exhibited a finite subcover of L extracted from the original arbitrarily chosen open cover of L. Therefore, L is a compact set. And so we've established here that compactness inherits from a compact set down to any of its closed subsets. A closed subset of a compact set gets to be compact as well. So that is the Heine-Borel theorem. 
And what, again, is terrific about it is that as long as we know that we are working with a subset of the real numbers or with a subset of n-dimensional Euclidean space, then we will get compactness, which is a very wonderful, very excellent condition for a set to have because it means that we can avoid that local to global heartbreak, right? We can get compactness only by taking a set which is closed and bounded. Right? That those mean one and the same thing for subsets of the real numbers and subsets of n-dimensional Euclidean space. If we're working in some other topological space jungle, right, then we know for sure that compact sets are going to be closed and compact sets are going to be bounded, but we don't know for sure that that arrow is going to go the other direction. Not every closed and bounded subset of a general topological space gets to be compact. But for the real numbers and for n-dimensional Euclidean space, it does. And so the easiest way to know that we're going to be able to avoid the local to global heartbreak is to know in the real numbers that we are working on a set that is closed and bounded. And we're going to really come to appreciate the value of this characterization as we move forward into really digging into continuous functions and how continuous functions work and how the definitions of continuity, when we predicate our continuous function on a domain which is compact, are actually going to let us reverse quantifiers and get epsilons that work for all x's rather than in a single epsilon for each individual x. So that's kind of ultimately why we're going to care so much about compact sets, is that we're going to be looking for ways to avoid conclusions that might fail because of the local to global heartbreak, conclusions that are kind of true point by point or neighborhood by neighborhood, but which fail to be true on my entire set. As long as my set is compact, we're going to be able to avoid that bad news.